Well, good morning. I am excited to be here. I'm excited that you're here. Those of you that are in the room, thanks for showing up. Those of you watching online, we appreciate you tuning in. Uh, many of you know that my wife and I are in the Christian preschool daycare business. Um, and this is a monumental month for us, October 2024, because it was October 1984 that we opened our first preschool. So this is our 40th year of doing this. Well, thanks. And so uh, it's been a fun ride. It's been awesome. But probably the, the funnest part of my job, uh, the, the part that I get the most joy out of is every Monday morning, I do chapel with a room full of preschoolers. And so that means that uh, I do some fun songs with them, and then I do a short Bible lesson with them. And I don't just do the newfangled kid songs like they're learning over in children's church. I'm old school. I like the classics, right? So I'm doing This Little Light of Mine and uh, The Wise Man Built His House. We even still do I'm in the Lord's Army. Yes, sir. You remember that one? Um, but probably one of my favorite ones is this one. You may remember this from your childhood. It's I'm all wrapped up. I'm all tied up. I'm all tangled up in Jesus. And, and the reason it's one of my favorite ones is because little three and four year olds, they can't do this, but they give it their all. They really try. And so just to watch them this last week, I watched a little three year old boy. He ended up looking like a flamingo contortionist. He was over there like this, trying to get it right. And it's so fun to watch him. But as I listened to him sing this song, I just thought, wouldn't it be wonderful if this really did become the anthem of their lives from this day forward, that from this day forward, they were wrapped up, tied up, tangled up in the love of Jesus, in his blessings over their life. But what I know, unfortunately, is that we live in a broken world. And this life has a way of kind of just chipping away at who God has created us to be. And these little ones are gonna move into elementary school and there's gonna be peer pressure and there's gonna be bullying. And then they're gonna get to middle school and high school and there's gonna be social media and comparisons and people pleasing. And then they'll move into college and out of college where they'll be you know, all focused in on getting just the right job and it becomes about power and position and how much you can make. And my fear is by the time they get into their 20s and their 30s, the anthem of their life will be more something like this. I'm all wrapped up, I'm all tied up, I'm all tangled up, period, full stop. There's so many of us that walk through life tied up and tangled up like this, tied up in, in stress and anxiety and worry and disappointment and exhaustion. Experts tell us that we are in a mental health crisis in our country today. Uh, one study said that 46% of Americans will meet the criteria for a diagnosable mental health condition at some time in their life, and that half of those will develop before the age of 14. Anxiety disorders top the list of mental illnesses in America, and they just seem to be starting earlier and earlier. I sat in on a parent-teacher conference just this past month with some parents of a four-year-old at our school. And it wasn't about his academics. It wasn't about his physical development. It was about his emotional development. He was struggling emotionally in the classroom where he was having outbursts of anger and temper tantrums and just couldn't manage it. And his teacher is so good with him. She pulls out this emotional wheel thing that has the pictures of the faces and tries to help him identify what he's feeling so that he can learn through his life to just navigate them in a healthy way. And as I listened to her talk to these parents, I thought, boy, I think sometimes I could use that emotional wheel, right, to help me navigate emotions um, better. Because my guess is some of us have walked in here today and we're tied up and tangled up in some emotions that are challenging to us, that are causing difficulties in our relationships, maybe in our marriage or with our children or at work and, and are really damaging to our soul. Some of us are being, our soul is being killed through all of this. And yet, What's gonna happen is, uh, I know you show up here today in a place like this, in a church, and you walk into town square, and someone says to you, how are you doing? How are you feeling? And you know the immediate response is the one I give. I'm fine. I'm okay. Everything's good. Because we, I think, have been programmed to think this is the right answer, right? This is how people of faith are supposed to respond. And if you're really spiritual, then you're gonna say, well, I'm blessed, right? We get in a competition with each other about how blessed we are. I'm so blessed, if I were more blessed, there'd be two of me, right? Or I'm doing so good that vitamins are gonna start taking me. And unfortunately, many of us have been programmed to think that the most spiritual answer is not one of honesty and vulnerability, but just, I'm doing good, I'm fine, I'm okay. 
And I think the church at large has not done a good job of talking about this subject, but this morning we're going to talk about it. We're going to talk about dealing with our feelings and our emotions in a way that is honest and healthy and honors God and leads towards his purposes for our lives. Because way too many of us have bought into the lie that feelings and faith just don't go together, that feelings are not part of the faith equation. And the message you may have gotten from the church over the years is that there is a right way to feel and there's a wrong way to feel. And so if you feel this way, if you feel sad, stop it. Don't do that. You need to feel happy. If you feel anxious, well, just read the scripture. It says, don't be anxious. Why are you feeling anxious? Stop that. And eventually, we just have to start pretending that we feel some way that we don't actually feel. And when you do that, over time, uh, your life will begin to unravel because that's not sustainable. I was reminded of it just this last month when I got a phone call from a friend from college who wanted to let me know that my college roommate, all four years, my best friend in college, had passed away. And I thought, I was shocked. I thought, I, I don't know how this happened. The last time I saw him, he was doing fine. He's a successful pathologist. He always takes good care of himself. Uh, what, what, what happened? And sitting around a living room with some of his uh, closest friends and family, I came to find out from his cousin that his mom had died a couple of years ago and that sent him down into this dark emotional spiral that he just couldn't get out of. And that it brought up other emotions and feelings that he's been battling with his entire life that he just never had a place that he could share those with or talk to people about. Now, my friend grew up in the church, the very place where it should be safest to express one's feelings and emotions without the fear of rejection and shame. And yet it wasn't. We're in the second week of this series we're calling Let's Talk About It, where we're st- We're stepping into some subject matters that are sometimes controversial, rarely talked about in church, at least not in helpful ways. Last week, Barry started us off with that easy, mundane, simple topic that we call politics. No big deal there. And this week, we're going to talk about mental health, which is one of my favorite subjects to talk about because it's what my education is in. My undergraduate is in psychology. I have my master's in counseling psychology, went on to do my PhD work, did all the coursework, never finished the dissertation. Apparently, that's required to get your degree, and so I didn't. But I'll never forget the first year in graduate school. One of the first things that was done to us is they said to my class of 10, you're going to go work in the university counseling center. Well, most of my colleagues had left school, gone to go do counseling, uh, and now come back to get their PhD. And so they had had some experience with this. I was coming straight from undergraduate, so I had no experience in what to do in a counseling room. So uh, I went to my supervisor and I said, look, students are going to be showing up. I don't even know what to do when I'm in there. Can you give me some tips? And she said, yeah, I'm going to give you four phrases, and I want you to Keep these in the back of your mind. I want you to use them when you're in the counseling room and they will be helpful to the people that you're talking to. And not only that, they'll be helpful just for your life. They'll be helpful in your marriage and with your kids. And so just have these always ready to go. So I'm gonna share these with you this morning. And look, I paid thousands of dollars to get these, okay, in my education. You're getting them for free, so you're welcome with this. But the first one was this. Just tell me more about that. Just be curious. Will you tell me more about that? Because you're wanting someone to be able to share their story with you. And as you say, tell me more about that, it opens them up to just keep uh, expressing what's going on in their lives. So that's the first phrase. The second phrase is, what I hear you saying is, and then you repeat back what you've understood them to say. This just helps clarify to make sure you're on the same page. But more than that, it also communicates that you are worth my taking the time to understand. And so those two are mainly just phrases to help people open up, to find out what's going on, to hear their story. But then comes the third phrase, and this one is a question, and this is where it gets a little more complicated, and it's this. How does that make you feel? How does that make you feel? And often this is where people have to do some some soul searching. This is where those picture cards would come in happy. I mean, come in (laughs) handy, not happy. I used to say uh, to university students when they come in, For counseling, let's just start with the four big ones. Glad, sad, mad, and scared. Where do you fall in that wheel of emotions? And let's go from there. Because for many of us, expressing emotions is not an easy thing to do. We're a very diverse church. We come from different cultures. We're in different age groups. And and that all plays a part in how easy it is for you to express your emotions. I grew up in the era where my dad used to say, 
You're upset about that? You wanna cry about that? I'll give you something to cry about, <laughs> right? And so th that was translated, don't feel that way. Just stop it. And so I, like some of you, have learned to just be an emotional evo avoider. I just try to keep it stuffed down. The problem with that approach is that over time, it's gonna come out one way or the other. Maybe in an angry outburst that you don't know where that came from. Um, maybe it's gonna come out with a prevailing sense of apathy and you don't know why. Some cutting words to someone that you didn't mean to say and you think, where, where is that coming from? But like Jesus said in Matthew 15, what, what, what's down in here is gonna eventually come out. He says, but the things that come out of a per person's mouth come from the heart. So one of the, the best things to come along for me, for an emotional avoider like me, is that beautiful thing we call the emoji. Because I figured out that emojis help me unlock emotions that I never even knew that I had. And I'll look at an emoji and I'll think, well, yeah, that's exactly how I feel. I'm gonna tack that on to the end of a text here. And so my most used emoji is this one. Y'all know this because usually I've done something kind of idiotic and that's what I'm sending to my wife, like, sorry, I forgot all about that. Uh, but to use emoji a language, um, this is how we want to feel, right? We want to feel happy. But sometimes we feel this way. We feel sad. We know we want to feel this way, just kind of cool, like everything's great, everything, you know, we're fine. But oftentimes we feel this way, anxious and uncertain and overwhelmed. We want to feel cheerful, but sometimes we feel like this. And sometimes... We feel like this, and sometimes we feel like this, right? <laughs> That's really the most honest feeling here. And then other times we find ourselves just feeling numb. Feelings aren't there at all. I'm not really sad, but I'm not really happy either, and I find in my relationships there's not much love and connection, but there's also not any bitterness or anger either. I'm just, I'm just numb. And so this morning, I wanna talk about what it looks like to have emotional health, because I believe mental health and spiritual health depend on the foundation of emotional health. Now, I told you there's four phrases that I learned in graduate school. I've given you three. I'm gonna wait to give you the last one at the end. I promise I'll get there. But before we do that, I want us to look at the life of Jesus and see how he handled his emotions and feelings while he lived in a human body on this planet. We're gonna be in the book of Matthew, chapter 26. If you have your Bibles or devices, you can turn there. And I know that for some of you, just the idea of Jesus being emotional as we talk about a very emotional time in his life is like uncomfortable because again, you think, well, emotions don't seem to go with spiritual stuff. But if you read through the gospels, one study found that Jesus experienced over 39 different emotions uh, during his time on earth. And some of you are looking at your spouse and thinking, I didn't even know there were 39 different emotions. And others of you are looking at your spouse and thinking, there are definitely 39 different emotions. That's just the starting point, right? But think about it. Jesus felt delight when the centurion expressed great faith. He felt sad when he stood on the Mount of Olives and looked out over Jerusalem and thought about those who had rejected him. He was angry when he turned the tables over in the temple. He was full of joy when his disciples would come back and tell him all the great work that was happening. He was sad. He wept when his friend Lazarus dies died and he even felt shame. And that one kind of took me off guard because I thought, why would Jesus feel shame? He lived this perfect life. And yet 1 Peter 2 tells us that Jesus felt shame. The trick, the, the catch is it wasn't his shame. It was my shame and your shame. But he knows what shame feels like. At times he was discouraged, he felt loneliness, he knew love and longing, uh, he knew pain and pleasure. And so the point is, Jesus' emotions fleshed out on the pages of Scripture show us that feelings and emotions are not associated with being weak. They're just part of what it means to be human. And this is who we've been made to be. So the question is not, are our emotions right or are they wrong? The question is, what do we do with them? What do we do with how we feel? And I think it helps to understand where the word emotion comes from. It comes from the Latin word emuvere, which just means to move. And I think the idea here is that God gives us emotions to move us. And the question is, where are they taking us? Pastor and author Kyle Eidelman uh, informed a lot of what I'm talking about today. And he says to picture your emotions as a vehicle and that you hop into the vehicle and you gotta ask, where is this vehicle going? What road am I going down? If I get into the vehicle of anxiety, where's your anxiety taking you? 
For in the vehicle of shame, where is my shame taking me? Or anger or guilt? Because again, these emotions aren't necessarily right or wrong. They just are. What matters is what you do with them, where they end up leading you. Because they can lead you to a place of despair and loneliness and depression, or they can take you to a place of forgiveness and freedom and connection and dependence on God. Our emotions can actually be an invitation, an opportunity for us to move closer to God. So let's look at how Jesus navigates some very difficult emotions and see what we can learn as we follow after him. Matthew 26, Jesus, it's already been a very emotional evening for him. He has sat around a dinner table with his closest friends, shared his last meal with them. Judas has gotten up to leave to go betray him. He knows that's happening. He knows what's gonna come next. They're gonna come arrest him. They're gonna beat him. They're gonna end up crucifying him. And so at this point, he's just overwhelmed with emotion. And it says this, then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to them, sit here while I go over there and pray. He took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee along with him and he began to be sorrowful and troubled. And then he said to them, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Sit here and keep watch with me. Going a little farther, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed, my father, if it's possible, may this cup be taken from me. Yet not as I will, but as you will. Jesus was emotionally overwhelmed in this moment, and he says, my soul is overwhelmed to the point of death. And I think there are some believers today who would try to talk Jesus out of that emotion. Come on, Jesus, what are you doing? Smile, God loves you. Don't you know Romans 8, 28, all things work together for good for those who love the Lord and are called according to his purpose? Come on, maybe you just need a little more faith. Are you going to tell Jesus he needs a little bit more faith? I'm not. And yet so often that seems to be our message to people, isn't it? It's wrong to feel certain ways or there's no reason for you to feel that way. And I hope that some of you, as we read this emotional time in the life of Jesus, that it frees you from the pressure that Christianity puts on people to feel like you have to be happy all the time. And if you came in here today and you're overwhelmed, maybe even to the point of death, Just know that Jesus does not say to you, stop feeling that way. But instead he says, I know how that feels. And just understanding that truth has the potential to completely change how we think about and process our feelings and our emotions. So I think there's three things we see from Jesus here in this situation that can help us learn to release our feelings to God in such a way that they can be redeemed and and move us towards a place of healing. And the first thing we see is that he just tells his friends how he's feeling and asks them to come around him. He says, my soul's overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. He's vulnerable with some of his closest friends. And that wasn't weak. That is strong. And he doesn't do it with all of his disciples. He does it with just three of them, his closest one. So I'm not telling you after this message to step out into town hall and the first one that says, how are you doing? Just to vomit up every raw emotion that you have. Nobody wants that. But there ought to be two or three people in your life that you can go do that with, that you can be honest with, that you can share the truth of what's going on in your life with. And it's gonna take strength and it's gonna take courage and it's gonna take a huge dose of humility And so Jesus says to Peter, James, and John, I'm overwhelmed. Will you just stay right here with me? Who are your people? Who are your two or three? So often our response is we just want to get in the car and shut the door and be by ourselves. That is not a healthy response. The second thing we see from Jesus is he's just open and honest with God about his feelings. Mark, uh, when he prays, he says, my father, and Mark uses the word Abba here for father. It's this very intimate term like dad, daddy. And he models this way to pray in a way that is just authentic and honest with God. Many of us were never taught to pray that way. Maybe you were just taught to recite some words. You're not even sure what those words mean anymore. And so you sit down at a dinner table and you say, God bless this food to my body, my body to my service and whatever that whole thing is. And it really means nothing to you. Or as a young child, maybe your parents sat on the side of the bed and said, you know, let's pray. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. And all those are fine. I mean, that's not the way a four-year-old talks, but it's fine to teach your child that. Be careful with that next line. It's kind of a shocker to a four-year-old. And if I die before I wake, the four-year-old is like, whoa, didn't even know that was a possibility. I might die before I wake. 
I'm not going to sleep now. And so maybe you still know those words and you can recite them, but they don't really mean anything and they certainly don't strengthen your relationship with your heavenly father. Can you imagine? Kathy's my wife, she's my best friend. Can you imagine if I got home every evening and just recited the same words to her and that I used a language that I don't really even talk in, right? So, oh my beloved, now I walketh through the door. I lovest thou to my core, but I have had a draining day, so I have nothing left to say. She would look at me like, are you crazy? What are you doing? Because that's not how real relationships work. And God wants a real relationship with you. It honors him. It delights his heart when you're willing to share the deepest, most vulnerable parts of yourself with him, the good, the bad, and the ugly, because you know he knows all of that already anyway, don't you? So look at what he does. He just cries out and he says, dad, my soul is overwhelmed to the point of death. What would it look like for you to pray that way, to say, Father, I'm just so stressed out. I'm so sad. I don't know why. I'm disappointed in my marriage, or I'm angry with my child, or I'm so bitter towards my parents, or I'm anxious about my future, God. I'm so lonely. I just feel like I want to give up living. When's the last time that you talk to God that way? Because God wants to redeem those emotions to heal those wounds, but he can only redeem and heal what you are willing to release to him. And then finally, the third thing we see Jesus do here is he aligns his feelings with his faith. In other words, he prioritizes his faith over his feelings. He aligns it with what he knows to be true. Look what it says. He says, my father, if it's possible, may this cup be taken from me, but not as I will, but as you will. So he's open and honest with God about his feelings, uh, but in the end, he concludes but God, it's not about what I want or how I feel because what I want more than anything is what you want for me. And that can be hard for those of you that are more, um, how should I say, emotional indulgers. Um, you know, my generation, yes, a lot of us are emotional avoiders, but there is a generation behind us that kind of swung the pendulum, right? And so this, if you feel the feeling, then that's what you go with. If you feel it, it must be true. Uh, I mean, my generation was the don't be a baby, and this generation is, oh, you poor baby, right? And so uh, just because you feel it doesn't mean that it's true. Jesus never succumbed to the, the mantra of if it feels good, do it. That's not the example that he set for us. Instead, he's honest and he's open about how he feels. He doesn't hide it, pretend it's not there, but he processes it with God, and he ends up concluding, but God, whatever you want, that's what I want. So you may feel like losing your temper and lashing out at your spouse, spouse or your child. You may feel like staying in bed all day and feeling sorry for yourself. You may feel like avoiding social situations that cause you anxiety. You may feel you know, lonely in your marriage and you wanna move on and have that affair. You may feel like getting the divorce and starting over or running up the credit card bill or moving in with your significant other before marriage or, or just sleeping around for fun. You may feel that way. And that's okay, those are real feelings, but just know that they're, they're okay because they're part of being human. But because they're real feelings does not mean they are true. And Jesus doesn't tell you to stop feeling that way, but he does have a truth to, to overshadow what you're feeling. Think about it, you may feel lonely, you may feel like you're all alone, that's a terrible feeling to feel. It's real, but it's not true if you're a believer. Jesus says, I'll never leave you or forsake you. He's there. And you may feel like you're in your current situation because God's punishing you for something or you deserve it somehow. But the truth says, if you know and love Jesus, every sin you've ever committed has been paid for by the blood of Christ. What part of he does not treat us as our sins deserve are you not catching on to? And you may feel shame and guilt and that might be a real feeling, but it isn't true if you're a follower of Jesus. The truth is there is no condemnation for those of us who are Christ followers. And the truth is you've been set free from the law of sin and shame. That is what's true about you. See, what Jesus really offers us is just freedom from all of that. Not necessarily the absence of anxiety or depression or panic, but instead it's his power and his purposes and his presence in the middle of those issues. And if you have that kind of freedom, what's the devil gonna do to you? He's already taken his best shot. And so we follow after the example of Jesus and you're honest with God about your emotions. 
And then you align your feelings with what he says to be true. And so here's what we see with Jesus. He goes to the garden. He's overwhelmed with his emotions. And he spends two or three hours just pouring his heart out to God. But by the time the soldiers arrive, he is resolute. Something has changed inside of him. He's no longer on his face. He is standing up. He's strong and he's determined. And he sets his face towards Calvary. Jesus models for us this healthy way to identify, process our feelings and our emotions with God, to share them with two or three close friends, to to be honest with God about them, and then to align those feelings with the truth of God's word. And that brings me to that fourth phrase that I told you that I'd get to that I learned in graduate school. And it's also a question, probably the most important one of the four, and it's this. So what are you gonna do about it? What are you gonna do about it? Because I think some of you are putting too much of this on God while you do nothing. I've prayed about this. I've been waiting on God for five years, 15 years. Nothing's changed. Well, maybe God's waiting on you because this is a cooperative thing. I heard a pastor say once that if there's a thousand steps between you and your healing transformation, God will take 999 of those steps, but you have to take one. You have to do your part in this process. So if this is about your marriage, go get some help for your marriage. If this is a physiological deal going on in your body, go get some medical treatment for it. If this is a financial issue, go get some financial counseling. Show up at our recovery ministries on Thursday night and just pour out your heart. Come down during the response time and allow the men and women who are down here to pray over you and to pray for you. Because look, you can sit here and you can listen to this message on mental and emotional health and nod your head and agree with me um, or most of what I've said, keep doing what you're doing and you will leave here and nothing will change for you. And you will show up here again next week and the next week and the next week and everything will be the same and you can put on a plastic smile and you can say, I'm fine, everything's good, but eventually it's all gonna fall apart and God does not want that for you. He did not create you to live that kind of life. He's promised you this abundant life and he wants you to live into it because look, every one of us here today, we're all wrapped up, tied up, tangled up. It's just the way of this world and it's not gonna change until Jesus returns. But you do have a choice today. You can leave here, you can leave it right there with a period, full stop, or you can add back in the line that makes all the difference. I'm wrapped up, tied up, tangled up, in Jesus. It's in Jesus that changes everything. Because your emotions are a vehicle that are taking you somewhere. And it's time for some of you to pull over to the side of the road and let Jesus in. And he doesn't want the passenger seat. He wants the driver's seat. In the words of that great theologian, Carrie Underwood, Jesus, take the wheel. That's what you need to say, right? That's part of the deal. So scoot over, give him the wheel, and then open up the back door and let a couple of close friends in with you. It's the way he set this up. He's with us, and then we're with one another. And you say to Jesus, where are we going? I feel disappointed, Jesus. Where are we going? And you invite him to meet you in your emotion. You invite God to meet you in that feeling. You might not think he wants in when you feel that way. He does. You just say, God, I feel scared. Would you drive? You invite him into your fear. Um, Would you hold on to me, God, during this? When you feel overcome with lust, you say, God, this is how I feel. Would you redeem this? Would you sanctify this? You invite him in. When you're sad and lonely and you don't know what to do and you don't wanna be around people, you just say, God, would you just come in here and sit with me? He would love to do that. See, we have a hope And this hope does not disappoint because our hope is not in something, it's in someone. And listen to me, your transformation, your healing, your miracle may not come in the package that you thought it would, but I want you to know this this morning. God is still at work and he is working today in all things for his glory and for your good. And I know that there are some of you here today who are struggling emotionally and mentally and spiritually And some of you, like Jesus, are probably overwhelmed, maybe even to the point of death. But I don't think you're here by accident on this Sunday in this room hearing this message. I believe the Spirit of God is at work this morning. And it may just be speaking to you. This is your opportunity 
to surrender it all to him, to invite him in, to allow him to move you to a different place. Jesus is wait, waiting, ready to move into your mess, saying, come on, let's walk out of this thing together. May today be the day that you make your move and everything changes for you. Let's pray. Father God, you know every heart and soul emotion that's in this room this morning. And you know what these emotions feel like because you felt them, God. And you just say to us the words Jason spoke earlier, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden. I'll give you rest. God, may we be a people who come to you and just lay it all at your feet. Would you move in the hearts of this room this morning? Would you pour out your peace over this room this morning, God? We love you. We thank you for your goodness in our lives. It's in Jesus' name we pray.